Hi, I'm Jelly Victoria and thank you for tuning into my channel. I am a lecturer in policing and criminology from the UK and um, so far we've looked at forensic science and we're continuing that journey today because there's so much to learn about forensic science. So there'll be a few more weeks on this, then I'm going to go into the law, so we'll look at the law side of policing, then we're going to put it all together and look at some famous cases. As I mentioned before, I will be talking about some um, high profile criminals, spree killers, serial killers and stuff but none of it is in like a weird glamorization way. It's purely scientific and because we're looking at how we've um, investigated these crimes and solved these crimes using the techniques we're going to talk about. So it's just to consolidate the knowledge. There's no glamorization here. I have no respect for uh, people who hurt others or who commit crimes. I've only got respect for the victims and obviously the processes behind it. What we're going to be looking at today is fibers and hairs, which can, although they're very, very small, can be crucial in solving crimes. And fibres and hairs get transferred all the time. Every single day, whatever you're doing, you're passing stuff here, there and everywhere. Everybody is, and that, that's normal. That's the cross-transference of material. Remember Lockhart, every contact leaves a trace. So, you know, they, they can't see my carpet, carpet and my socks, etc. Passing things all over. Now then, when you look at fibres, you, you've got three that you look at. So, uh, my maid, natural, and a mixture of both, like a blend of both. And... When you're looking at these fibres and hairs, sometimes you can think like, oh, sorry, a bit of fluff, a bit of fluff, right? A bit of blue fluff, a bit of blue fluff. No, it's not. So from, it could be that um, you might have got a similar looking jumper to your friend, you might have both got these blue jumpers. But when you analyse those fibres, the manufacturers have used different dyes, different blends of material, and they can be quite specific, which is obviously really important, isn't it, when you're investigating things. And we're going to talk about that in a crime, we're going to talk about later on. Well, a massive case I'm going to talk about later. Um, when you're collecting fibres from scenes, you can do what's called fibre mapping. And that's where you take um, many samples from the scene of the fibres. So you, you might do a lot of tape for that. And you can see uh, the position of victims and suspects by doing this fibre matching, but, mapping. Sorry, But obviously that's only going to work if you haven't compromised your crime scene. But one thing you need to make sure you do if attending a crime scene Always wear the correct PPE and follow procedures. Don't just wander in there messing everything up because you're going to put, you're going to corrupt your scene and you're also going to potentially corrupt any evidence there. And you know, there's been no justice then. And also, if you're shedding bits of fibres and hairs all over the place, you're placing yourself at the scene. You also don't want to get other people's stuff on you. We'll talk about bodily fluids in a different one. Anyway, so that's fibres. Um, hairs are similar in terms of how it's transferred over. So as with fibres and hairs, the length of time, the, the two surfaces are together contacting, and the pressure depends on how much fibres and hairs are transferred over. So if the force is quite violent and it's for a long period of time, the likelihood of those materials passing to each other is a lot stronger than if it's a brief, not a brief passage, but obviously you might still pass those along, so it will be investigated properly. Um, when you're talking about the transference of hairs and fibres, you might hear the terms primary or secondary, and that just depends on um, how many things um, the bit of evidence has, has gone from. So say a hair comes from my head and goes onto somebody's shirt, that's a primary transfer. If that then goes onto a sofa, a couch, or curtains, that's a secondary transfer. I hope that makes sense. Okay. So that's fibres and hairs. So when we're looking at hairs, you can tell absolutely anything about, well, a lot from people's hair. You can tell a colour, natural colour, so if you've got chemicals on there and not the dyes. Um, you can tell, um, you know, people's ethnicities. You can tell if it's curly or straight. You can tell from any um, substances within the shaft. You can also look at the follicle um, and test for DNA. So hair is amazing. You can find a lot out from hair. So it's really important we find these pieces of hair. It's tiny pieces of evidence that we collect it properly. So when you're looking at hair, you wouldn't necessarily use taping because there is a chance that you could affect those forensic opportunities on the hair. So if you're going to analyse it for chemicals and stuff, the tape could affect that. Um, you could use tweezers or forceps so you package it correctly. But I'll talk, I'll do a whole thing about the packaging of exhibits because it's massively important. And always wear gloves. Always wear gloves. Carry two sets in your police uniform if you are a police officer, obviously attending a scene. Okay, so with fibres and hairs then, like I said, only a, a few of these fibres can lead investigators 
to the right person and to solving these crimes, which is hugely, hugely important when we're looking at getting justice for those victims and their families. The case I'm going to talk about today is a um, massively high profile serial killer case in the United States of America. And we're going to talk about Richard Mark um, Ivonitz. I think that's how you pronounce it. So Richard Mark Ivonitz, um, serial killer who killed of three people we know about and had a fourth victim who thankfully survived. So it started in 1996 in September when a young lady, Sophia Silva, vanished from the porch, which is like a front yard. She was doing homework and she just disappeared. No evidence, no witnesses, nothing. She's just gone. And it was five weeks later that she was found in a nearby creek where, when they discovered Sophia's body. And the only evidence they could yield was some fibres. So they found some pink fibres and some small blue fibres. And the pink fibres, um, the detective at the time said they looked similar to something you get off of a bath mat or something like that. So that, that was their investigation, which was obviously started here. Eight, uh, I think it was eight months later, eight months later, it was, yeah. Um, two sisters disappeared, so Katie and Kristen, I must make sure I pronounce right, Lisk, Katie and Kristen Lisk, and they both disappeared on the way home from school. They got separate school buses, but they both vanished. Again, no witnesses, nothing. So it was actually five days later that these two girls were discovered in a river, and on those bodies they found some fibres and some hairs. Um, the fibres looked very similar, the small blue fibres, very similar to some of the found on Sophia. Now the police, with this information, really went to town with that investigation. They chased 12,000 leads, they compared 1.2 million DNA samples in the DNA database, um, and did 10,000 examinations on these pieces of evidence. And there were only three hairs and 190 fibres that they were relentless in trying to solve these crimes. And they never gave up. But it wasn't until five years later that they finally caught the culprit. So five years later, there was a, a young lady watering her plants in the front garden, and she was abducted by gunpoint um, by um, Ivonitz. She was forced into a container, placed in the boot of a car, a trunk in America, and driven to a property where she was assaulted. Um, she was the victim of a horrific assault for over 18 hours. Her assailant then um, fell asleep and she managed to escape. Thankfully, she escaped. She went to the police and the police came back to his property, but he'd gone. Two days later, after a high-speed police chase, they found him, but before they could formally bring him to justice, he, he shot himself, which you never knew, really know how the family's gonna feel about that. It must be awful. So they wanted to make sure they definitely got the right person. So even though the MO was quite similar, they wanted to make sure it was the same person. And this was in Colombia, which was in a different place to the original crimes, which were in the um, Spotsylvania. So what they did is they went to his house and they found 600 items of evidence that they wanted to inspect. They did find a pink bath rug, a uh, bath, bathroom carpet bath mat in the bottom of a box in the wardrobe, which matched the fibres on Sophia's body. They also found some furry handcuffs and the fibres from those match the fibres on all of the victims' bodies. They've got the man. Now, the icing on the cake, really, for the investigators and for, you know, for having that justice for the families, was finding some fingerprints in the boot of his car, which matched those of um, Kristen Lisk. They, they matched hers, so we have a positive identification there as well. So, that was the end of the case there, basically. So, we finally found out who was responsible for the deaths of those three young women absolutely atrocious crimes and thankfully this person's off the streets but there you go that's how fibers and hairs have helped solve that case which is incredible isn't it so you think those tiny little pieces of, of evidence they helped solve the case and also there was some hair found in i think it was katie's sock that was a dna match to evanus as well so there was no doubt that he was a person who was responsible for those crimes so that's fibers and hairs i hope that kind of makes sense and I've not waffled on too much. There are many crimes where fibres and hairs have helped solve them. So the Stephen Lawrence murders, uh, murder, sorry, in the UK, where young Stephen was um, subject to a, rape, a horrific racial attack and lost his life. Um, there were fibres and hairs involved in that one. And I'll talk more about that in a different, um, different video. And also um, with Ted Bundy as well, the fibres and hairs have helped a lot of cases, but that was just one where they were, you know, the main thing that helped 
solve that case. Thank you for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. And, you know, uh, let me know if there's any other kind of areas you want to look at. I think I'm probably going to look at bodily fluids next or blood pattern analysis, blood spatter analysis or blood splatter analysis, depending on whereabouts you are. It's the same thing with three different names. It's probably more as well now. But anyway, yeah, thank you very much and see you next time. Thanks.